All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jeppe Kirk Bond, the most copied popular investor on eToro. And welcome to this uh, Q124 uh, quarterly investor update. If you uh, want to use this presentation for anything, please go ahead and read the disclaimer at the bottom of this slide. So the agenda for this presentation is that I will talk a bit about my background, then my investment strategy, what I have in my portfolio, and then I'll finally go through all the many questions that I've received and provide some answers. So firstly, one of the reasons that more than 20,000 people are copying my investments on eToro is that since 2013, I've had an average annual return on investments over 24%. And that's really better than anyone you could fairly compare with and also with a relatively good um, return to risk profile. If you want a higher return in that period, you would effectively have had to take on a lot more risk. My background is from strategy consulting, advising some of the largest companies in the world on a strategy and valuation. Um, valuation means calculating how much a company is really worth. And as I was doing that, I was making more money than I was spending. And so I wanted to invest my money. Then I looked at what my pension fund were offering, what my bank was offering. And um, my, you know, I was frankly quite unimpressed. My pension fund, for instance, was only investing in Danish assets and charging quite high fees. So I thought, okay, I can definitely do better than that. And then um, I compared all the different platforms in terms of, you know, how good is the website? How good is the app? How uh, is the platform developing over time? What are their fees like? Which instruments are available? And I scored all the platforms on these and then weighted them based on how important the factors were. And then eToro came out as number one. And then uh, I started investing on eToro. And then um, as that uh, continued to go very well, um, some of my friends and family members started uh, copying me on eToro and then more and more people started and, uh, to copy. And in 2018, I then quit my job as a management consultant to focus only on managing my investment portfolio. And then it's just continued to go well since there. And yeah, today I'm uh, the most copied uh, investor on the eToro platform with uh, 23,700 investors that are copying for a combined 64 million US dollars. Um, I don't do everything on my own. I have a great assistant who helps me make some good analysis. I have a great network of experts that I trust, especially on complex topics. If I invest in something, I must either myself be an expert or know someone who is. Um, I also get really strong support from eToro. So whenever I have any questions or concerns, uh, eToro is always really uh, quick and good at helping me. Then I subscribe to all the best uh, data providers and have access to the best IT tools so that anything that can um, be automated in a good way is automated in that good way. And finally, I'll highlight my three favorite experts, which are my three brothers. One of them, he's the CEO of a marketing company. One is an economist with the Danish Ministry of Finance. And the last one uh, has a degree in computer science and now working with the foreign aid. So if I have any questions or concerns within these areas, then those will be my go-to guys. Then my investment strategy is based on some principles that have been there all along and continue to be here. I focus on macroeconomics. That means identifying different pockets of the global capital markets that can potentially have some extraordinary profits or growth rates. It means scanning and analyzing mega trends. So these are trends that can grow for more than 10% per year for more than 10 years. Then I focus on fundamentals. That means really analyzing companies carefully to understand as much about them as possible with the eye of then valuing what is the company really worth. That means understanding the products and services, what the management team is like, what's it like to be an employee there, what's it like to be one of their customers, what are the different strategic options, how might their competitors respond to those, what are their financial statements like, and so forth. All of that just with an eye on valuing them. And then... I like to invest in companies that I have valued a lot higher than their price. I focus on the long term. That's the most difficult for most people to understand of these uh, six uh, principles. Because of course, if you are always right in the short in the short term, then the long term will take care of itself. Um, but in if you um, want to run an investment portfolio well or manage a business or even manage your life, you're really much better off by focusing on the things that will matter, you know, at least 10 years from now. If 10 years from now, something won't matter at all, then like you can also ignore it in the present to an extent. Um, there's a great quote from the author of the 
book, The Intelligent Investor, uh, Benjamin Graham, who was also sort of Warren Buffett's mentor. And he wrote that in the short term, the market is a voting machine. In the long term, a weighing machine. So in the short term, it can be very important what some people think, other people think. But in the long term, if a company becomes very big and profitable, then it would be very nice to own a large share of that company. And I have the patience to wait around uh, the time it takes to get to that weighing. Then I focus on risk management. I diversify carefully across many different geographies and different industries and different business models. I currently have 59 different investments, none of which make up more than 6% of the portfolio. And I'm well hedged against many specific tail risks. So tail risks are those risks that are quite unlikely to happen. But if they do happen, they could have a very outsized impact. So for each of those, I like to have a proportion of my portfolio that could potentially help me in such a scenario. Finally, I focus on keeping the fees low. I don't use any leverage. I don't trade any high fee instruments and I keep a quite low trade frequency. And I pay the same fees as the people who copy me pay. So by squeezing, you know, keeping the fees low is just one great way to squeeze a bit more profitability out of one's portfolio. Then there are some areas where I see great opportunities. I love organic growth. That means companies selling more products or increasing the price of their products by more than the prevailing inflation rates. But it does not mean companies that are growing inorganically through acquisitions. So if it come, you know, sometimes at the big, of the annual report you can read oh we grew our revenue by two percent this year and then i think yes that's correct but that's only because you acquired another company actually your core business shrank by four percent so what you've accomplished is really not that impressive at all on the other hand there are some companies that are able to acquire other companies at a good price and then start growing them after and that does count as organic growth and that i do like I love companies that are resilient, that can do well, not just in a few positive scenarios, but across a wide range of scenarios and have really strong balance sheets and have a strong competitive advantage either um, right now, or at least they are building towards one. Then I like companies that are profitable, that are delivering real positive cash flows and ideally are able to reinvest those profits into their own business to ramp up that growth rate over time. I like companies that have a new, uh, bold company strategy in, because you can sometimes end up then paying uh, the price of the old strategy, but receiving the value of the new strategy. And uh, it's not enough to me that a company say they have a new strategy. I must see some real action that prove to me that they are, you know, that they're really going to be executing on this new strategy. So see some bold real steps like selling off a part of the company or making a specific acquisition or you know even something just like changing the name of the company is a good indication that things are really going in this direction. Then I like companies with great products. Um, if you're a smart shopper and you know like this product is better than that product and these are the important features here and these features are not important, it's worthwhile to pay more here or not. If you're constantly buying the wrong products and finding yourself having to return products because you bought the wrong one, you know, then it's just going to be very, very hard to also be able to assess companies because ultimately the companies are going to be making products and services and you need to understand what it is that they're really making. Um, a classic example of failing as that was when um, Steve Barmer, the former CEO of Microsoft, he held the first iPhone in his hand. And he said that it was too expensive. It didn't have a keyboard. The business customers wouldn't want to use it. And uh, he was very comfortable with his position there for Microsoft. And he was, of course, completely proven wrong by the massive success of the iPhone. And that was just a classic example of not even being able to predict the present, holding the blockbuster product in your own hand and not understanding that this is the blockbuster product. And many people have made uh, similar mistakes with, uh, for instance, Tesla, and will probably continue to uh, do similar mistakes of staring at the blockbuster product and just not being able to identify that that's what they're staring at. Um, then finally, I like companies that are mission-driven not just because I sometimes believe in the mission, but because it can be a great way to attract and keep the smartest, most hardworking employees without overpaying them. There are some companies where the smartest, most hardworking people, they just they just really they will travel far and do anything they can to work in those places. And there are other places where if a smart, very hardworking person has bewildered his way there, then it will not take a long time before they'll be looking to get out of there again. And whether a company is in one end or the other of the spectrum, it will really show itself in the financial statement a few years down the line. Um, then my portfolio on eToro is almost entirely invested into stocks. I also have a property that I rent out. Many people that copy me um, have 
property that they live in. And, you know, now they're building up stock portfolios. And this makes very good sense because historically stocks and property have been the best investments. And if you look at the current numbers for these assets, they look like they might potentially continue to be the best assets. Now, stocks significantly better. Um, bonds have historically been okay, but not great. And are Right now, when you um, look at the interest rate you're getting on the bonds compared with the inflation, I still think not that great. Commodities have historically not done much. They've done a bit over the last 30 years, but not great. And I don't think they'll be the, the best place to have the most of one's assets parked. Currencies have historically uh, been very bad. They are currently bad, and I think they will continue to be very bad, principally because of so money printing. That's really what's, what's hurting currencies in the long term. Um, then there are some big factors that really drive economic growth. I like to separate them into the physical world, the social world, and the technological world. So within the physical world, um, I look at nature. Um, how much oil do we have in different places? How much of the different types of metals? How easily accessible are they? How many trees do we have in different places? I focus on life animals, but chiefly humans, how many people do we have in different places and how are the demographics changing over time? The companies that have the right products for the right demographics in the right places, of course, have an advantage. Then the realm in which the most value can be uh, destroyed or created the uh, fastest is in the social realm. So if you have um, a document that proves that you own your house or a stock or a bond, then um, all that is, is a social construct. If we believe in this social construct, then it can help us transact with one another, cooperate and create a lot of value. But if we stop believing in these, then that value can disappear very quickly. But why do we even value anything? If um, nobody wanted to, uh, to, to live in a house, and nobody wanted to look at a house, then a house suddenly would have any value. Even though people think, you know, a house clearly has value. It's very tangible. You can really sense it. But what we value can change fast. If something is changing at a rapid pace, even if it's coming from a small part of the world, it can suddenly be all over the world. And if you can um, get in on that, then it can be the basis for a great investment. Then finally, there's the world of technology, all the way from the deepest pits of the R&D lab to you know consumers that are making slight changes in their houses to how they're using the products. Chief of uh, the technological drivers of growth are the foundational technological shifts. So going from the agricultural revolution to the industrial era, to getting the internal combustion engine, getting electricity to the digital era. And now we are living through uh, the next big revolution, which is the artificial intelligence um, technology, foundational technological uh, revolution. Then from that big grand uh, set of factors that drive economic growth, we can sort of look at what is the global economy looking like today? So real growth around the world is not as great as it used to be, except in India where it's uh, quite good. But um, we're not uh, you know, in, a, in any uh, severe uh, set of problems either. Unemployment is lower generally than it was before COVID, which is nice. And many of the problems we're seeing with unemployment were also there before COVID. And um, in um, India, there is a bit of a special case as you have very high growth, but also very high unemployment. So effectively, the growth has managed to be uh, spread out evenly across the country. And you see very different unemployment rates in different states in India. And um, also by different demographics, there's much higher proportion of unemployment amongst the young people, for instance. Um, in terms of interest rates, these have climbed up to a lot higher level than they have been in the past years, but are still not at the historical averages. Inflation is still higher than uh, central banks' stated goals of 2% in uh, Europe and the US, although it's uh, come fully down in China. Um, but there is the potential danger that the last stretch can be harder. So it's a fear that potentially going from 5% inflation down to 3% is easier than going from 3% down to 2%. And that's sort of um, what the, the, the central banks must do. Uh, yeah stick around for and, and, and hold a bit out for and see if we're really getting this inflation down based off of the current measures taken. And uh, only then will there be firepower to lower um, interest rates and, um, and combat any potential issues that we could be seeing in the economy, either from a new shock or just from a sort of steady slowdown. 
Then there are some uh, mega trends that I've identified as extra interesting. So if a company is uh, riding on the wave of or uh, driving one or more of these mega trends, then it's more likely to be found in my portfolio. So firstly, I like to focus on the nice to haves. When we humans, we have it all, then we like to compete with each other in fun games and in who can have the better fashion. Um, and there are some great companies with amazing profits and great growth opportunities in these spaces, some of which are to be found in my portfolio. But the nice to haves can in the world really only stand on the shoulders of the need to haves. If you don't have the need to haves, then the nice to haves, they fall completely away. If you don't have security, then you can't have the niceties. And um, some of the companies that are the most key to protecting us and delivering that security over the next many years, they are to be found in the portfolio. Similarly, if you don't have your health, then you can't you know, accomplish anything. Whether your goal was to help your family or get rich or whatever it was, you can't do any of it without your health. And there are companies in the health insurance space, in biotech that are to be found in the portfolio. Finally, there are the enablers and accelerators that help us do all these other things faster, better, cheaper cheap of these artificial intelligence. So the companies that have been making the biggest breakthroughs in AI over the past years have all been in my portfolio. And AI is a very big theme in my portfolio at this very moment. Finally, there are the um, companies that are going to be making the next generation of amazing advices that we will be using in the future. And they also will be found in their portfolio. Then when you've identified an industry or ecosystem or other group of companies and you want to get a quick overview of how they stack up against each other, a great way is to look at the, the multiples. So this is an example of the Magnificent Seven, so the seven large American tech companies, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, Tesla, NVIDIA, Alphabet, and Amazon. So if we start in the top left corner, we can see that all of them have very nice profit margins, but NVIDIA and Microsoft are certainly quite a bit ahead, and Tesla and Amazon are quite a far behind on that metric. In terms of growth rates, all of them are growing nicely, except Apple. They are standing quite still. And uh, NVIDIA uh, really, really uh, growing by a much higher pace than any of the others. The two top charts here, the higher, the better, because they're about profitability and growth. But the two bottom charts, the lower, the better, because they're effectively about price. So at the bottom left corner, we can see that for every dollar of profits that Microsoft is bringing in, we have to pay $30 we invest. So that's sort of sensible. But for NVIDIA and Tesla, we are paying respectively $63 and $83. So we'd only want to pay that much more if we think that they can boost their margin or sustain or improve their growth rate. Otherwise, we wouldn't want to pay that much more for these companies. And similarly, at the bottom right, we can see that for every dollar of revenue Microsoft have, we have to invest $13 uh, to our uh, rights to that $1 of revenue. And that's uh, a lot higher than many of the others, but it's certainly nothing compared to NVIDIA where we're paying $38 for every dollar of revenue. But if you compare NVIDIA to many of the others, they are, do also have a higher profit margin and they're growing the revenue by a lot more. So it sort of makes a, a bit sense. I tend to look at large data tables like this all day. They either come in automatically via my data providers or they are um, updated by myself or my assistant um, based off of our subjective insights that are subjective but numerical. So for instance, how uh, good looking is the CEO on a scale from zero to 10? That would be subjective but also numerical and thus it can be used in my valuation models. So all of that data that comes in from the data providers combined with my uh, subjective insights, they are put together to make those valuations and um, calculate what the companies are worth and rank them based off of how valuable they are compared to their prices. And then I invest in the companies that are at the top of that list. And any company that is, you know, um, highly attractive that I haven't invested in yet, you know, any company that I've invested in that's amongst the least attractive is always, always at risk of being replaced by the uh, most attractive investments I haven't made yet. Um, and then I conduct all my risk scenarios to see how my portfolio or different variants of my portfolio could perform in different risk scenarios. So if you know this or that scenario was to materialize, what would the impact be? And then with my valuations and my risk scenarios in hand, I make my decisions. And those decisions can either be research decisions. So you know maybe I've identified a new risk and I need to learn more about this risk. And as I learn more about it, it tells me about some other company. I have to learn more about this company. And with every company that I analyze in deep detail, I always learn something new. There's something special about every company. And you know, when I uh, many years ago uh, analyzed Meta 
or Facebook, as they were called back then. I didn't just learn about Facebook. I also learned about the concept of social media marketing and thought to myself, hmm, I wonder what kind of companies are advertising on Facebook. Are these the smart companies or are these the dumb companies? Oh, it turns out it's the smart companies. Maybe I should start um, evaluating companies on their social media marketing going forward. And so then, um, you know, that's the thing I learned from analyzing Facebook that I couldn't apply when I'm doing valuations of other companies. And then over the years of just doing many, many, many valuations and finding out what's the, you know, unique thing about that company and applying the knowledge from that to my valuations, I've, you know, just made it better and better and better over time. And of course, as my research decisions help me to decide what new data I need to get helps me understand, you know, um, what change I can make to my way of doing valuations and risk scenarios, which then help me to know what I need to know more about, which then makes me do more research decisions and so forth. As that circle spins, it's always causing me to be considering which uh, companies I like the most and then making investment decisions based off of that. And that can either be that there's a company I've already invested in that I want to, you know, reduce my position or increase it, or there's a company I haven't invested in before that maybe I want to add it to the portfolio. And when you add up all of those investment decisions, it effectively becomes my portfolio. And if we compare my portfolio with the U.S. economy, we can see that in the U.S., it's not just one industry that has all of the economic activity. There is economic activity across many different industries. So, um, and yeah, many, many, many good investment opportunities across many different industries. If you look at my portfolio, it's uh, skewed more towards certain industries. I have slightly more invested in tech, in climate and renewable energy, in financial services, in health and biotech, and in the metals and mining. If we look at the largest positions of the portfolio, they are currently Meta, Microsoft, TSMC, UBS, and the host hotels and resorts. And you can always see the, the whole list of all the assets that I have in which proportions uh, on etoro.com or in the etoro app. It's yeah, it's all you can always see exactly what I have at any given moment. And um, that was my presentation. Um, thank you everybody for watching. And I'll now go through the many questions that I've received and uh, yeah, provide some answers. So firstly, why are you adding funds now? So there's a long list of factors that all go into making such a decision. Um, the most important are the new reallocation feature, the personal financial decisions, and uh, the market timing. So firstly, with the reallocation, this is a new feature that eToro introduced at the end of last year, where whenever um, a copier adds or removes funds, or whenever the popular investor adds or removes funds, then eToro automatically reallocates so that to the extent possible, um, the proportions you invested in each asset is the same. And um, yeah, that's just very nice. And I really love that eToro has added this feature, ensuring that no one sort of uh, goes out of alignment on the for doing various things. And um, then secondly, I have some extra cash that I want to invest in stocks. Currently, that cash is just earning um, what I think is a relatively low interest rate compared to the inflation. And so I would much rather have the, that cash invested in some stocks. Um, what is the maximum one can copy with? So the maximum is a two million US dollars, and just for uh, to to note, uh, the minimum is five hundred US dollars. Um, what are your thoughts on the renewable sector? So in general, I love the renewable sector, and I think um, combating climate change is one of the most important things we have to do politically on Earth at the moment. But it's not every company in the industry that I think are great investment opportunities. There are many that I think will not be able to make that much profits even as the industries are growing. And those ones will, you know, are, are not um, exciting to me at all. But there are some companies that I think are, are, are very uh, good investment opportunities. And those are yeah, the ones that are in the portfolio and there are a few others that are good, but not good enough to be in the portfolio. What is your outlook for solar companies such as Solar Edge and Sun Power Corp? Um, so uh, I like the solar industry very much, but it's also a very competitive space. So I don't like every company in the industry. I have first solar and solar edge. I don't have a sun power corp in the in the portfolio right now. Is the electric vehicle sector in a bubble? I don't think so. I think electric vehicles is the future of uh, the auto industry. And I think there are many companies in the space with good profits and good um growth rates off of their EV business. There are others that are losing a lot of money and where I think they are, you know they're not great at all and then yeah uh, but but you know, i've been a tesla shareholder since 2016 and i'm still very uh, bullish on that specific company and in general i don't think the ev sector is in a bubble is tsmc still a good investment given the noises from china so yes tsmc is one of my biggest positions i really love the company they are you know by far number one in their industry and 
there is a huge, huge growth opportunity for this company in relation to making the chips we need for AI. But as the question also has, is the noises from China. And those are really, really bad. That's a big um, risk premium being you know, forced in on the stock because of this, because you have to take this danger really seriously. There are many different um, bad scenarios involving um, you know, uh, China's relations toward uh, um, Taiwan. And that that that's a risk that ultimately is worth taking in this scenario because the upside is just so great for TSMC. But I wouldn't put all of my money into TSMC because I wouldn't want to have you know my entire portfolio exposed to these particular uh, uh, risks. But but as a part of a portfolio, I think it's a very good uh, risk reward re situation we're getting with this uh, with this investment. Would you ever get into crypto? So yes, and uh, currently about a half percent of the portfolio is in Bitcoin. And I like the idea that Bitcoin has a maximum final supply of 21 million. Um, so you don't have this situation with normal currencies where there's just a constant uh, expansion of the money supply and a constant inflation hollowing out your value. But that said, I'm not a big fan of blockchain. I think a lot of crypto projects, they, you know, they just because they're based on blockchain don't mean they can do anything extra special so that they're, they're, they're really um, sort of useless. And I think that there's a lot of issues in the financial sector that if crypto becomes, you know, the mainstream way for uh, payments and, and savings and such, those issues will then creep back in. Once you start using cryptos as the basis for doing a lot of loans, then you're going to have, you know, pooled loans. That's going to look a lot like banks. And then you get back to all the problems that there are with banking that people think like, oh, you know, all of these bad things about banking, we can get rid of those if we use crypto. No, once you use that a lot, you get back all of those bad things. So it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of, um, lot of reason why I potentially wouldn't uh, get significantly into crypto. But I'm very happy with my, my small Bitcoin position. I think it, it makes a sort of in um it has a very good space in the portfolio and could potentially do well in certain scenarios, even when some other things wouldn't do so well. What valuation metrics do you use? So I've built my own valuation metrics over the last uh, 10 years of uh, in investing and just you know making them better and better over time until um, I have my, yeah, I would say, quite unique framework that's a competitive advantage and that I obviously um, won't uh, be sharing with anybody. Do you look at price earnings ratio? So absolutely not. And this is a junk metric that uh, is very popular with economists and journalists because it's easy and undisputable. You can, you know, nobody can dispute what the price is. Nobody can dispute what the earnings are, but everything else is up to some, you know, um, requires a bit of knowledge of accounting. And I think price earnings is used a lot by people that don't really understand company accounting. And uh, yeah, it's just not the, there's basically no question to which the, that's the right metric to be looking at, except like, yeah, what are other people using sometimes? How high is the recession risk in the US and Europe in 2024? So it's elevated, it's higher than it normally is, and it's much higher in Europe than it is in the US. Although Goldman Sachs, um, latest number is just 15% recession risk for 2024 in the US. So that's, you know, a very normal level, even a below level. If you look at um, recessions, uh, historically, they've come, uh, there's a recession about every six years. They typically last for one and a half year. They um, typically cause markets to decline by 18% in the beginning, but then recover the full amount. Um, they cause unemployment to go up by 3%. So I think when people think recession, it's important to really think recession. Recession doesn't mean depression. Often when people hear the word recession and they hear we have, you know, like, oh, um, there's a 15% risk of recession and, you know, there's a recession every six years, then they see mental pictures of the great financial crisis and, you know, the great depression. But those are not the issues. Like most recessions are much, much milder than that and are not, you know, the there's much bigger risks in the world, like the big geopolitical risks, risk of a communist revolution, risk of AI killing everybody, risk of nuclear war that are much, much more important to, you know, adjust your portfolio towards than uh, recessions. What is your strategy for dealing with a potential recession? So historically, whenever the markets have gone up, my portfolio has gone up by more. And when the market's gone down, mine has typically gone down by less. And that's my goal in terms of dealing with recession. I'm happy with losing money in a recession. I don't expect to be profitable in every single period of time. There will be ups and downs and that's perfectly okay. But I do want to you know, 
beat the market. So if the market goes down and I go down, fine, but I should not go down by as much as the market. And the way to avoid that is to have an overweight of companies that can potentially do well in a recession compared to other companies adjusted for uh, the current price level. Sometimes you have an asset um, that has historically done relatively well in recessions or at least done better than others. But if everybody knows this, then it's already incorporated to the price and potentially even incorporated too much into the price. So you're paying a lot for that recession insurance and then it's not worthwhile. So you have to find some um, things that will protect you a little bit extra in a recession, but where you're not paying too much of an insurance fee effectively for that protection. And that, that that's always the art. You know, sometimes you can find um, an adjustment to make to the portfolio that will say, this will give me a higher return, but only increase my risk a little bit. And I think it's worthwhile. Other times you have the opportunity to say, okay, this will almost not reduce my average return across the scenarios, but it's, um, it's going to make me uh, a lot... Uh, my portfolio less risky and then then that's a good adjustment to make and so i'm always balancing those things out in in order to have my um you know see what what kind of recession protection can i get in there that won't you know conversely hurt me too much that i'll be losing out on all my potential upside um and and yeah yeah I, I, the most extreme if you wanted to be if all you cared about was protecting yourself against uh, downturns you could just have a portfolio made of of, of you know very very uh, um safe assets in some balance, you know, with a high proportion of inflation protected government bonds. These will always be in green every month, but, you know, it'll be with such a small amount that after 20 years on average, you'll just have made a lot, lot, lot less. What are your thoughts on AI related investments? So I think that's the most exciting uh, theme of investments in the world. And um, many of, you know, it's certainly there's not a single investment in my portfolio where I haven't thought about how they will be impacted by AI. That it's, it's a very important question for every company. And the companies that are very key to delivering this AI revolution or that could potentially get very big savings from AI or have another you know, sneaky roundabout way to benefit from AI that many are not necessarily seeing. Um, yeah, those are, those are very important uh, things to think about as an investor right now. Do you think we are in an AI bubble or is there substance to the current trend? So you could potentially argue that AI is overestimated in the short term in terms of its impact, but underestimated in the long term. But when I make investments, I focus on the long term. I'm happy to have an asset if I think it's going to be when you add up the profits they will have for all of the years and discount them back to the present worth a lot more than the price I'll be paying now. And then I'm sort of, you know, that I'll, I'll happily lock that in now knowing, yeah, yeah, others might bid it down in the short term or something like that. But I, I that, that's not the kind, I'm happy with that, that that kind of risk. What I don't want is to not be owning this asset when suddenly it becomes obvious to everybody that, you know, th this is an extraordinary company and they're really starting to deliver those profits. And so I'd, I'd much rather take the risk of having that early than suddenly like uh, having it, it spike and I wasn't, wasn't, you know, didn't have a, a strong position at that time. And so I don't think we are in an AI bubble overall. I think we are in quite the opposite. I think we have uh, some companies here that are going to make, you know, the, 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 the highest profits of any companies ever. It's a much more, it's a much greater technological revolution than any we've seen before. And I think the, 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 the yeah, that will, that will show in the, in the, in the profits in the future and, uh, and having, a large stake in this now is, is a great, um, great thing to have. Do you think you will increase investments in Palantir, C3 and other AI companies? So I have Palantir now. I don't have C3. I'm very happy with my Palantir position. I generally don't comment on what I might buy in the future. I don't give like an advanced warning saying, oh, in three hours, I'm going to be buying Palantir because then obviously others can go in and buy it up before I buy and then I would be getting a worse price. So there would be no, you know, for me and my copy. So that, that would be, I, I would never do that. How does the upcoming American presidential election influence your strategy? So I probably spend a lot more time on politics than I can justify from a pure investment perspective. Um, my dad, he was a leader of a political party and a member of the European Parliament for 29 years. And I did my bachelor's degree in political science. Um, I typically make my predictions for, you know, who is going to win each different state and uh, who's going to get the nominations person who's going to win in each state and then what kind of impact different candidates would have on different kind of industries and i think for instance the uh, trump in this case would be better for oil and biden would be better for renewables overall 
it's important to not overestimate how much a single uh, presidential election can do. Steering the American and world economy, you know, it's like a big ship. You can shift a bit in this direction, a bit in that direction. If you put all your energy towards one case, you know, you can make a difference as a president on that one thing. But it's not like you can just change everything really quickly. Um, and you know, when when uh, when Obama got elected, you know, some people thought like, oh, now everything's gonna change. Then when Trump got elected, think like, oh, now it's all gonna go. And in reality, like a lot of the stuff that happened under Obama or under uh, Trump would have also happened if Biden had been president or if uh, Trump had been president while Obama was president and so forth. That's a lot of stuff that's not really um, where where it's just going to go that way at different paces, but it is going to go that way. There are some issues that are going to be dealt with um, by that party eventually. And so it's just a question of where that gets postponed a bit, but it, it, deciding on that president or that president doesn't ultimately change the long-term outcome for you know a, a political direction. Um, but yeah, I, I weighed in like that in... Um, and it, it does have an impact, of course, on, on some specific industries. How does your performance compare with NASDAQ 100? So if I had invested my money in the NASDAQ 100 uh, 10 and a half years ago, instead of uh, doing my own investments, then I would have had less than half of the return that I did. So I've very much outperformed the NASDAQ 100. Um, the correlation to the NASDAQ 100 has been about 0 0.4. It's been a 0 0.6 towards the S&P 500. Um, so it's not super correlated either. And obviously, a lot of people uh, often um, think that you can just, um, oh, why don't I just buy an S&P 500 ETF and invest all my money there? Or why don't I just buy an S&P 100 ETF and invest all my money there? And if you do that, you know, then you, people think of it as like, then I have a low fee uh, diversified investment, but it's the opposite. You're actually paying a lot of fees for these ETFs and you are getting much not very much diversification at all. It's very, it's only American stocks. It's very much skewed towards the biggest ones, which are disproportionately in tech. So you don't get that sort of geographical diversification with many different industries. And, um, and uh, yeah, and also uh, since uh, the last uh, 10 years, a lot, lot lower return compared to at least what I've done. How do you tackle the fact that copiers buy at different prices? So it's a common misconception that this is an issue, but it's, it's not an issue at all. Effectively, if I'm invest, I'm investing in Microsoft right now because I want to be invested in Microsoft right now. And whether or not it's good to be an investor in Microsoft right now does not depend on whether you invested yesterday or one year ago or 10 years ago or haven't invested yet. Either it's good now to be invested in Microsoft and that's based on whether how Microsoft will do from here and forward. Not on... Uh, like if you had a, a position in, from, from the past, I have some stocks that I've... You know, I've, I've, I've increase my holdings over time. So I have um, both a, a, a red and green positions on the same stock, but that, that doesn't have any influence on whether or not I want to have that stock today. So when people copy me today, then I have 5% um, in Microsoft, then they have 5% in Microsoft, we both have 5% in Microsoft. And if that's a good decision today to have 5% in Microsoft, and three years from now, I'll be very happy that I had 5% at Microsoft today, then you know that's good for, for me and uh, my friends and family that copy me and other people that copy me. And if it's not good to have Microsoft today, then it's not good. And then we'll all be sad that we had Microsoft today. But ultimately, it doesn't matter whether you had it for a year or five years or whatever. It can matter in terms of um, of taxes. So if you have a position that, you know, you've been building over time and then you are, you're you're closing it, then, you know, you might have to pay capital gains tax when, when you close it. So that that's an impact. But but other than that, it's it really, really doesn't matter. How does the new reallocation feature work? So when a copier adds or removes funds or when the popular investor adds or removes funds, then eToro um, buys or sells shares to adjust the percentages to, to the extent possible, um, match the proportions of what the popular investor has invested. So if I have a 5% invested in Microsoft, but you were in as part of your copy sold some of your Microsoft to not match it or for the many other reasons people can fall out of alignment, then... Um, yeah, then then it'll just buy back to to set those percentages to be equal, so that you know if whatever percentages I have invested, that's the same percentages that copiers have invested to the extent possible, and that's just a really really great feature. And um, yeah, I'm very happy that eToro has introduced this. Are you an eToro employee? So no, um, the specific question was, are you an eToro employer? But I assume the person meant to ask if I was an eToro employee, and no, I'm not an eToro employer or an eToro employee. What is the geographical split of your portfolio? So it's currently 60% North America, 20% Europe, 15% Asia, and 5% the rest of the world. What percent of your portfolio is in UK stocks? So it's about 1.3%. It's the, um, only one company. It's the Renewables Infrastructure Group. And then 
it's um, if you look at the total exposure, it's actually less than one percent because only um, half of um, of Trick is actually um, UK business. They also have business in Ireland, Sweden, uh, France, Germany, and Spain. And um, but then of course there are many other companies in the portfolio that do have some UK business. You know, Microsoft is an American company, but people buy Microsoft products all over the world, including UK, not just in America. So then when you add that back up, you still end up with less than one percent exposure to UK stocks. Ultimately, you know, I have 59 positions in the portfolio. There's like 210 countries in the world. So I'm not going to have a stock from every single country. I do have a stock from the UK. You know, I'd like to have more. UK makes up about 3% of the global economy, GDP wise. And um, so if I want to be sort of uh, average weighted for uh, for UK stocks, then, then, you know, I should potentially add a, at least a, a, another UK position or ramp up my, my holdings of, of, of trick. And I lived uh, seven years in the UK. I love the UK. And yeah, I'll be happy, you know, potentially in the future to add more UK stocks. What are your views on UK stocks? Yeah, so there are many great ones that I cover and um, they are good, but there's just other companies that I like even more that are than the ones that are in the portfolio. But yeah, if, if, uh, if things change, prices come down or valuations come up, then there'll be some point where I'll, I'll be adding more UK stocks. Is it worth waiting for the euro US dollar exchange rate to become more favorable before adding funds? So in some specific cases, yes, but typically no. If you are having a lot of cash and you are waiting for the exchange rate to change before investing in stocks, then in all of that time you're waiting, you are effectively a currency investor rather than being a stock market investor. And currency investors, they have a lot worse returns than stock market investors. So on average, it's bad. And um, so it's on average better to get that money invested into stocks right away instead of sitting there and waiting for the exchange rate to change. In terms of exchange rate risk in general, um, for most people, it's not worthwhile doing much about exchange rate risk, but in some extreme scenarios, it is. If, for instance, you have all of your assets and your income in US dollars, but you have all of your expenses and liabilities in euros in Europe, then you are very exposed to the euro US dollar exchange rate. If, for instance, the US dollar suddenly halved in value, so when you were uh, you know, giving one euro instead of getting one dollar, you would be getting, giving one euro to receive two dollars then suddenly you would have seen your assets and your income halved in value compared to your expenses and liabilities. Very big shock. On the flip side, of course, if the US dollar became a lot stronger, you know, if it doubled in value, then you would see your assets and your uh, income being twice, uh, yeah, being doubled while your expenses and liabilities remain the same. But that could potentially mean that you know, a big swing in the US, uh, euro US dollar exchange rate would have a big impact on you. And to counteract that, it would be, potentially feasible to take a euro US dollar position in the markets so that if then the US dollar goes down a lot and you are losing a lot in your life, well, then you are gaining a lot on your currency position. On the other hand, then of course, if the US dollar goes up a lot, then you'll be losing a lot on this position. But you know, then if, if, if you lose a lot on the, if the US dollar uh, goes down a lot, then you'll be losing a lot in your life, but you'll be gaining it on this position and, and yeah, vice versa if the US dollar goes the other direction. Um, but you know, you also see many companies, for instance, if a company, they have all of their sales in America and US dollars, but they have all of their manufacturing costs in China and Yuan, then they will take, they will not um, usually hedge all of that exchange rate risk, but they will partially hedge it to say, we don't want to have an exchange rate move here, completely wipe us out. We want to reduce our exposure here a little bit. But for most people in most situations, it's not that extreme. You'll have, you know, income and assets in, in liabilities and expenses that are more or less currency matched. And so you are actually not that exposed to, uh, to, to, to exchange rate risks. Are you moving towards more dividend paying stocks? So unfortunately, yes, I don't like dividends. I think it's um, just a terrible way to pay out money to the shareholders because as a shareholder, you just receive that money. And so you can't do anything about the timing and it could be a bad timing, but you, you know, maybe you don't need cash right now. Maybe you, you know, you're going to receive that money and you're going to immediately reinvest it. So all you did was to pay extra transaction costs and potentially extra taxes. And so it's just really, really bad for you. Now, um, Meta, they just announced the dividend. So now we'll be starting to receive dividends from them. And um, that's, uh, you know, gives them a few minus points in my book. But as they announced $1.3 billion of dividend, they also announced $50 billion of share buybacks. So buybacks is still the main way that Meta is going to be giving uh, 
value back to shareholders. Um, and to some extent, there are a lot of um, not so smart investors that just like dividends. And so when they go in and search for dividend stocks, then they'll find Meta on that list and that might lead them to want to buy Meta. So giving a small amount of dividend, you know, can entice those kind of shareholders. But by and large, paying out dividends is is bad, but it's not so bad that it would, you know, if there's a company that's just really amazing, growing, profitable, huge future company with a very low price, like I'm not going to not invest in them just because they're giving out a small dividend. So it's a few minus points. I don't like it, but but it's ultimately really the sort of uh, the, the defining uh, criteria for, for, for an investment. So that was my uh, my presentation here. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everybody, who uh, submitted questions. And um, yeah, uh, let's have a great quarter.